I'm looking forward to this conversation, naturally talking about expeditions past and future. I know mm -hmm. you have a very important one coming up in February that we were talking about before we hit record here. So yeah, I think this conversation is going to go about expeditions and adventure and nature and why you do that. Yep. And also looking forward to talking about the leadership aspect as, sure. as well and how you match that with, with everything you, everything you do on your personal side and also on the professional side as well. And then I guess the third part would be like, how do you balance the architecture as well in that compartment of, of your brain? So looking forward to the conversation. Yeah, me too. Yeah. So what are you most excited about these days? Uh, most excited mm -hmm. about these days would be my expedition coming up uh, this winter. I mean, that's really on my mind a lot these days. It's uh, difficult when you do these major expeditions. Uh, the hardest part is getting to the start line. There is a huge amount of uh, sponsorship required to pull them off. Certainly when you have uh, aspirations like we do for this particular expedition with filming and so forth in very, very remote locale. So, uh, yeah, it's been full, full bore for the last, well, essentially we've had this dream to do this for three years now. So there's been a lot of work <laughs> going on for three years. But the last, uh, last year has been pretty nuts. And this uh, expedition is going to capture which specifically? Well, we're traversing uh, Ellesmere Island from the southern point to the northern point. Uh, for those that don't know Ellesmere Island, uh, in the Canadian High Arctic, um, it's 10th largest island in the world. And sort of beside Greenland, Greenland's bigger, uh, but it's at the northern end. So when you're at the tip, northern tip, uh, there's a Royal Canadian Air Force Base. They're called Alert. And Alert is the eyes and ears to Russia right now. And it's the furthest, most northern permanently inhabited settlement, if you want to call it as such, on the planet. And there's 50 odd people there, military, uh, live year round. And uh, that's where we're going to be finishing. So it's a pretty neat idea of, of traversing this landscape that few have ever traversed before. Uh, certainly the route we're doing at the time of year we're doing and the way we're doing it, it's never been done in modern time. And it's going to be really eyes into uh, a different place, truly like Mars. And it's always been a passion of mine to go there. And what's the inspiration behind doing it? Well, it's an interesting one because it's, it's changed. Uh, as everything does, right? Uh, you have uh, you have goals, but your purpose is kind of always the same. But for us, the goal was originally for myself and my teammate, Ray Zahab, who I skied to the South Pole with and so forth, uh, to ski across Ellesmere. That's what we know. We, we drag big old heavy sleds across these landscapes. And uh, we know it well. We've done it a lot. And uh, we set out to do this. We anticipated it would take us 50 days. Uh, with all our research, it, it suggests that it would. And we started out and realized pretty quickly that uh, we did this. We attempted this two years ago. And uh, as we were heading out, it was uh, real cold. Like we're talking next level cold there, minus 50. And it's interestingly, we could not move the speed we had thought we could. And not with the gear. We had, we had 50 days of food, about a 300 pound sled. And we anticipated we'd be able to do, oh, you know, uh, maybe 30K a day, up 20 to 30K a day. Uh, was the hope and uh in the end we were doing 10 kilometers a day and killing ourselves doing it and realized this thousand k journey was going to take 100 days not 50 and we had 50 days of food uh so all the alarm bells started going off uh at the time we had a snowmobile with us for a period of time independent of us but filming us because we wanted to capture this too not just be out there with our little cameras we wanted to get something of this so they were going to be with us for a while and we thought, well, okay, let's go from being uh, unsupported to a supported expedition. Let's give them some of our gear for a short period of time before they turn back. And maybe that'll speed us up as we go. It sped us up a little bit, but still it was proving to be very, very difficult. But with this extreme cold, these machines couldn't survive. So they started to break down. And there were older machines and they just, there was no way they were going to make this journey or as far as we had hoped as well. Everything was falling apart. And it was finally on the last day that, um, or second to last day, uh, machine, one of the machines had broken down in camp. They were fixing it. And Ray and I said, we're just going to go. We're just going to ski ahead. And uh, we'll meet you guys what we do. And it was like, I don't know, nine in the morning. And you understand again how nasty it is out there. And we were going much lighter now. We weren't carrying our survival gear with us. We basically had a shotgun for polar bears packed with some, you know, down jacket kind of thing. And off we went, anticipating to hear the drone of the machines coming through in the next couple hours. And um, nothing until 4 in the afternoon, 3.34, and lights 
dropping, of course, because that part of the world, it's getting dark real quick at that time of year. And it was getting real cold. We had no gear. There was no machines. And I remember looking up on up on that hillside and there was there was a pack of uh, Arctic uh, uh, wolves checking us out. We were, and interestingly there, you'd think that'd be kind of fun. The wolves of Ellesmere, summer, very nice, evidently around Eureka. And according to all the locals in Greece Fjord, they will hunt you and eat you in a moment. So here it was. Well, I don't know what group they are, but they're up there. And we were also now back in polar bear territory, really without the stuff we needed to protect ourselves. Um, and it became serious. So we started to turn around and start to ski back, figured the machine's not going to come. We have another now 25 kilometer return trip in the dark when we heard the drone and the machine coming. Mm. And the next day, uh, we said to ourselves, we're not going to go until the machines start in the morning. And the next morning, of course, the machine didn't start. And we just stayed in our tent. It was 1.30 in the afternoon before it started again. And we realized, no, this is not going to work. We've got to rethink this. We've got to pause. And we could have just quit and said, you know, beaten, done it. Uh, that's it. But no. And uh, on our way back by machine, Terry Noah, a young uh, guy was helping us out and is going to be helping us on this expedition as well, saying, you know, if you had dogs, dogs would be the perfect solution for this. You don't worry about the machine, in a sense. Uh, you don't need fuel for the machine because you just have food for the dogs and you can hunt that on the land. They're natural polar bear protection, and this is the way the people of the north have been traveling for millennia. And it was a real aha, going, okay, maybe that's a way to do this. So uh, fast forward two years, and we're now going to be uh, doing a combination of, of uh, skiing and dog sledding. You don't just hop on a sled. You actually end up skiing beside it because the dogs are just kind of helping you with your gear. But we've also, uh, we have uh, uh, teamed up and partnered with uh, two young uh, Inuit leaders in the communities who are part of our team now and will be doing this with us. So uh, it's become a joint non-Inuit Inuit team and coming together in a really, uh, in a real way. There's nothing forced here. These are friends and let's do this. And uh, it speaks to all sorts of fascinating things, uh, as, as certainly uh, with, with us learning from them and them learning from us, uh, doing an extreme uh, effort like this. They're going to learn a lot, and we're going to learn so much on the land from these guys. So um, pretty stoked on that, actually. It's going to be an amazing journey, very different than anything I've done before. Wow, it's so in-depth and so much involved with it and yeah. and the the Inuit folks up there when when you told them about this what what you wanted to do and what you're going to do um, and and they're on board with that they think it's that's it's possible uh beyond it, that but it's not something that they naturally do on a you know. no no because it's it's uh no one in this that community of Greece or anywhere there have actually traveled that far north they go to a certain spot on they know Ellesmere to a degree but nowhere that far north i mean this is right across the island right and it's next level for them too they're super stoked. And I just got a, a, a sort of a note there, a text message from one of our young teammates. And he says, I just can't wait to do this. Oh, like cool. he was just stoked on it. Right. And um, I mean, these guys are badass, yeah. right? I mean, they, they're out there hunting every day. They're, you know, fending off polar bears all the time. Like this is their world. And they uh, are very comfortable in that. And that's what we're going to learn. But also what they can learn from us is actually how do you physically certainly as myself and Ray, we're older now, like we've been doing this forever. And, but we understand how to do it. And it's like, how do you take care of yourself over that period of time, pushing yourself that hard, for that long, and come out the other end successfully, not falling apart. And uh, there's gonna be a real uh, ebb and flow of, of, uh, of, you know, information between us that I think is going to be fascinating. And then as part of that, are you are you helping them train during these months ahead of the expedition? In February, which is about only three or four months out, like, are you, you must be mindful of their physical fitness and what they're doing to prepare. And yeah, um, uh, definitely. And uh, uh, certainly, I, Ray has been more involved than I on that. Uh, he is a trainer by profession. So uh, he's certainly been uh, involved and suggesting, but in many ways, you don't overstep your grounds either. Like right. you don't want to pretend they don't know uh, either. So it's uh, being very conscious of, uh, you got to keep fit and you got to get ready and being a lot younger, we'll probably have no problem. <laughs> but, uh, but that end of, uh, and certainly surviving in the, the real challenge in those, in that environment is the cold. You got to understand that it's, 
I don't, I don't know if I want to, but try it. Try it cold. here. I, it's stupid cold. Right? How cold? Uh, what well, what, what, I mean, what does that feel it, like? Uh, well, it feels nothing except that it's just it's piercing through you and just wants to get into you all the time. And the only time you're comfortable is when you're moving. If you're not moving, and that's the misconception, is that it must be so hard to ski all the day. Well, actually, no. In those environments, the only time you're happy is when you're skiing because you're warm. It's every other time you're not so happy because you're getting real cold in the tent, whatever it is. But to give you an idea, I mean, I was mentioning to you earlier I'd last like, year on a reconnaissance yeah. uh, 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 trip last year to Bath, and it was um, we had a special thermometer minus forty nine point seven. Uh, winds were accusing at hundred k an hour, so we're talking by the charts minus eighty five Celsius. Like that's crazy cold, and enough so that um, my front tooth I just bit into a um, fig Newton and it snapped right off. Right off. So that gives you, that's how brittle things get. So I'm in the process now of getting this implant and everything else because it snapped off. I mean, mama, like how cold is that? But also to give you a sense of like the way at nighttime when you sleep, uh, to give you a sense is that this is a, probably a good feeling is that, you know, you, you have a thermarest kind of, you know, or, or but a foamy on the ground, but then you get a super down mat foamy as well. So it's double mat system. So you're really trying to get yourself off that cold ground. And then you wear like full top bottom uh, Arctic level underwear and fleece, top and bottom in your body, neck warmer, big sealskin hat um, and booties. And then with that, I slip myself into a um, into a vapor barrier, which is kind of like a, you know, a, almost like a plastic bag, I suppose, to prevent moisture from going into the sleeping bag. And then I slip myself into a, uh, beyond that, a zero degree down bag, uh, zipped up to my mouth. And then I slip myself in, not in this process, of course, but a minus 60 degree down bag, one of the best in the world by Western Mountaineering. And I have this much exposed and your nose is exposed. And I always think it's going to get frosty because it gets so cold. But then you're generally okay. You're warm-ish at that point and you fall asleep. And typically at three or four in the morning, you wake up convulsing. You're so cold, shaking with all that. Mm -hmm. And you, it, you realize it's really hard to combat that cold. Like it's just coming at you, right? And add to this the fact that there's polar bears outside and they're coming. And can you imagine the process of having to unravel yourself out of this apparatus, then get yourself dressed and then go outside to get your shotgun to shoot a shot into the air to scare it away? It's going to take you 15 minutes. It's one of these things is that there has to be different tactics. <laughs> um, so you're definitely putting yourself out there a little bit with that. Um, but that gives you a sense of yeah. it's, it's all consuming all the time. So what did there's, there's, it's not like there's someone staying up on, on guard. Like, what is that procedure? If, uh, if a, well, you have a, you, you put a, uh, you put an emergency line and you have a polar bear fence, they call it, and just a wire hmm. and you hook up a, uh, a shotgun shell to it. It goes hmm. bang or a blank that is. And the theory being that when they it trips it, that or a flare goes off and it scares it. 1300 pound predator that is three feet away from you. Yeah. Sometimes yes. Sometimes no depends but that's your that's your safeguard however the best because you don't know they're there until they're there uh, but the best form of defense is a dog and having dogs they know when they're a kilometer away and they start barking and gives you plenty of time to get ready if you have to go out uh, so dogs are have always traditionally been the way to protect yourself from bears bears are much wary of a pack of dogs whether they're going to come in they'll scare them off and they really are your first line of defense against a bear. And that is a very real thing up there. The dogs are amazing and they, they thrive. And, you know, you get this back, pushback I've had from people say, oh, it's cruel to the dogs. No, it's not. They love it. These are special Greenlandic dogs. These are dogs that have been doing this forever. And they thrive. They just, they, minus 50 degrees, they're curled up outside. And this is what they do. Not our local dogs could not do this. Um, but these dogs, and they just love it. This is what they're born and bred to do, traveling on the land. And their owners love them. I mean, they're part of their family. So it's, there's no cruelty involved here. They're, they are part of, of, of travel, and they're part of their lives. So they have to treat them well. But uh, interestingly, and as a side note, and which is the most important thing to this story, in my opinion, is that um, between 1950 and 1970s, uh, there, was, uh, there was a real effort to... Uh, based on Arctic sovereignty reasons, to make sure that people were permanently inhabited through our Arctic islands. 
Ellesmere Island had no one. I mean, it's the 10th largest island in the world. It's the closest one from Canada to Russia. And it's like, who's to say that it's ours? You know, and the only way you can have people saying that it's, it's uh, I mean, a country saying that it's our land is that people living there permanently. So that was the initiative for the Canadian government to start to relocate Inuit people to settlements all through the north. And, you know, you go, I've been to the village of Pangerton, that they took them from Cumberland Sound on Baffin Island, moved them to Pang. Uh, and Chris Fjord was from five families from northern Quebec who were taken up there and said, oh, really good hunting. Surprise, surprise, you're going from a landscape where there's trees to honestly the most out there place on the planet. But then the Inuit were nomadic people. They would travel by dock. And it was like, fine and dandy, you can settle them, set up. You guys just stay here. We're going to go and people will just get up and they'll go again. And you know, what's going to hold them there? So in all their wisdom, the Canadian government decided they would prevent them from traveling on the land by killing all their dogs. So if you talk to any elder in, in the Arctic, it's called the dog slaughter. And uh, there's thousands and thousands of dogs were killed by the, by the uh, RCMP. And I remember speaking to one elder in Pang, Pangerton. And she was telling me how she remembers as a little girl, uh, piles of dogs that she put at 10 feet high out on the sea ice burning. So there's a real, uh, it, there's, a, there's something there that has not healed yet. There's a wound. And uh, in 2019, the Canadian government officially apologized, uh, saying that, yeah, we made a mistake. And um, has tried to bring, bring back uh, dog teaming as a culturally relevant activity for the Inuit. Well, what better way to do it than a, a joint Inuit, non-Inuit team going together to do something that has never been done in modern times? Maybe 10,000 years ago it was when time, times were a little bit different. But in our times, nothing like it. By dog team and really showcasing what's possible out there. And we're fortunate enough because we're also uh, partnered with BRP, with Skidoo. Because we're going to have Skidoo's brand new ones that can survive this, the best of the best, with us throughout this journey, filming it all. So we're going to come away with we have National Geographic photographer, National Geographic videographer on this journey who's going to film it independently of us. And we'll be, we'll be a, you know, like independent in a sense of no assistance, but geez, we're going to be a team together going through this thing and come away with, uh, with a really interesting story. I think. So okay. I don't know where it's going to go, but I think there's a lot there. Yeah. So what, how many, how many total people will be involved? In uh, between nine and 10. Okay. Yeah. So not, not that many. Well, not that many, but yeah. uh, but that's a lot for me. Where I'm yeah, used yeah. To going two and three people for me, like nine or ten people. Wow. Uh, probably ten. And uh, four of us, uh, two dog teams, uh, one musher, one skier, and uh, so that's the four of us. And then uh, the camera team, essentially, which will be six people, machines. Um, they have to bring their own fuel. We have a fuel drop, all these challenges, of course, associated with that, but capturing the story and capturing everything and, and actually connecting with uh, kids. Cause we have, we have 25,000 plus classroom, get that 25,000 classrooms, uh, linked to this expedition through, uh, I2P, uh, uh, raise, uh, uh, nonprofit and, uh, can geo education. So legit. And uh, there'll be all sorts of lesson plans and connecting with the kids when we're out there live oh, wow. by B again, by this video streaming service, as well as after the fact and having all these lessons plans created about the geography, about the changing environment, about the, you know, the Inuit culture and what's being lost and what's being hopefully uh, in some ways supported again. So I think there's gonna be a lot there, uh, almost too much in many ways. You sort of have to find your, your way through it. Yeah. So how, how are you doing that with? Um... Like are you, you're the expedition lead, so if in terms of safety and coordinating and things like that, I'm sort of thinking with the with the folk the, with the folks on the uh, like the camera crew essentially, right? Yeah. You know, they, they obviously have to be experienced enough to be part of this adventure, but there's got to be some, you know, maybe there's going to be some other tough calls during the oh, there will expedition be. And, uh, that, that need to be made. Oh yeah, and 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 Terry, uh, who helped us last time, he's 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 leading that side. Of the expedition, the snowmobile side, and uh, he's one of the most experienced guys in that part of the world. I trust him with my life, so he was—he's going to be able to take care of them. We're going to be working together as a team. Obviously, if something is catastrophic happening, we're going to be conscious of it as well. They're never going to be very far from us because they want to film us. Uh, we can't move as fast, of course, because we're a bike dog team. But uh, I, we're going to be one unit, obviously, moving forward. Uh, but we want to 
be independent in, in the sense that we're not taking stuff from them, taking food from them. We want them to say it's very doable as we're doing it as as our one intact team. They're there to film it. Um, in many ways, we're going to be the best defense for polar bears for everyone, I, albeit everyone's so experienced up there. They have no fear of these. As Terry was putting it up on Eureka Sound, which we'll be uh, traveling through, um, there's one corner called Bear Corner. Uh, go figure. And he said one time uh, there a few years back, he in spring, he had um, he had clients up there that were filming uh, wolves, I believe it was. And uh, in one evening, or a course of one night, he had, as he put it, 10 separate visits by polar bear. 10 separate. So usually you get one polar bear every few weeks. Having 10 in one night, is, it's obviously just they're everywhere. So, what's what's a what is it like being that close to a polar bear? I don't know why. They, oh, really? <laughs> well, I have been. I mean, yeah. yes, I have, but not that much. Uh, but yes, I have. They're big and interestingly, as uh, and they're fascinating in creatures. As and again, as Terry was describing to us, he says um, it depends. You can tend by, tell them by their mannerisms what they're up about. If their ears are up and they're kind of perky, they're curious. But ears are down, heads down. And worst, if they're going huff, 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 means they're coming to kill you and just start doing whatever you got to do to survive. That, that's, and it's like, I never want to see a bear going huff, huff, huff. <laughs> would be not good. Wow. <laughs> um, well, I, I mean, I, uh, I'm excited for this expedition. I'm, I'm uh, a little jealous that I'm not part of it, but also quite a bit not because it's, <laughs> I, you, you know, I've, I've done uh, some backcountry trips and spent some time in the outdoors, but it's, it's, it's a lot of work. Yes. It's a lot of preparation. It can be scary. Yeah. Uh, you can feel very alone. Like even, even backcountry ski hut trips, you know, out, um, you know, in the interior here in BC, if you're in a cabin with, with 10 people, helicopter access or ski in, ski out. Yep. I've, I've had moments where, uh, very anxious, yep. very anxious. Like or nobody's around even sort of same sort of thing that you may get on an airplane or something like, you know, if you stop breathing or something, um, anxiety attack type thing, right. Very uncomfortable. Yeah. Very uncomfortable. Do, do you ever, cause if you're, if you know, you're, you're very exposed up there. You are. It's funny. I don't dwell on it and it's interesting because yeah, it could be overwhelming. And, uh, and I've been on trips like that. I love those trips. Um, but, you know, one place I would have got that, I suppose, more than anywhere on Earth would have been uh, skiing to the South Pole. Like you're, I mean, I remember I loved it. It was a weird thing. And I remember I was the last one into the tent typically at night. I, I, my job, I cut the snow chunks and tossed them into the vestibule. And guys, and um, a number of night, days, nights, like it's funny because it was always day. It was 24 uh, uh, hours of sunshine there at that time of year. Uh, that's still plenty cold, of course, but I would walk away from the tent. I would just, I would walk maybe 100, 200 meters away. And I remember I'd just stand there and go, you know, and I think to myself, I'm in the entire planet Earth right now. I'm probably the furthest away from anything living, myself and my three teammates, than anything else on the planet. Because even if you're in the most remote ocean on the planet, there's life all around you, like it's all beneath you, right? But Antarctica is quite unique that way. There is no life. There's nothing on the continent, like around the edge there is, of course, except there's a half inch insect that they theorize is blowing in off Saharan winds or some winds uh, that live on distant mountain peaks, nowhere close to us, but that feeds off bacteria. But that's the only living creature on Antarctica. There's nothing else except people at bases and us. And you think to yourself, I am so out there like this is mars in many ways true and i loved it it's strange i didn't get I, that doesn't give me a sense of anxiety uh, i actually find it really inspiring i love the fact that i'm giving this up i've been given this opportunity somehow to be in this place where really no one has been very few people have been and uh I don't know. I just figured, figured it was kind of an honor and, and, and something fantastic. So, no, it didn't freak me out. Other things may freak me out. Nice. Yeah. But not that. Nice. So where, do, where does that inspiration, like, where does that inspiration come from to, to A, you know, you, you, you're also an architect, you're also a facilitator, you're also a speaker, so you have a professional side as yep. well. Um, you seem to, like, everything you've talked about so far is, is, is 
like a lot it's 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 strategic and it's involved but it's a lot of play too oh, right yeah, we're yeah. going for a long walk across the most northern island totally. in in the world but yeah. it, it it comes from a, a place of exploring and inspiration which again is very childlike as well yeah. and, and exploring but where 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 does that drive come from to, to keep on doing these extremely hard expeditions and but also do them in a meaningful and, and purposeful way well i mean i mean interestingly uh it is childlike, and I, I guess I have to point to my childhood when it all happened because uh, that's the only way. Because I've been asked that many times, why, why? I mean, I'm inner city kid from Montreal. My parents didn't own a car. Um, I grew up. My parents came from Ireland, had us, and uh, we were, you know, uh, just trying to make a life of it in in Canada and Montreal, uh, but downtown Montreal, uh, and uh, really, uh, the outdoor world was not even on in the horizon like there was nothing no understanding of that but uh when i was nine um my brother and i got separated from my parents in a in a department store downtown we'd gone in from where we were living uh, by metro bus whatever and uh it was february freezing cold middle of winter kind of thing typical montreal dark and uh we were in this big department store downtown for people in montreal and know these big department stores baytons and so forth and um it was around closing time at nine o'clock at night and my brother and I being kids running around and got separated from our parents and an overzealous security guard decided to kick us out rather than help us find our parents. And um, I remember being literally thrown onto the street, this little kid and being freaked out. And I remember I wasn't dressed for the cold because we'd come by bus or Metro and here I was outside and Montreal was going off and it was snowing hard. It was cold and dark and I was freaking out. And all I wanted to think of was that I just wanted were my parents right and then my brother started to cry and i remember like looking down at him and him looking up at me and all he said was uh i want i want mom i want i want to go home and uh you know i was nine he was five and i remember just holding his hand and saying i'll get you home and i had no idea what i was doing and i had no idea where home was and i started to walk and um, looking back on it now, I kind of know where I was going. I, would, I went in the wrong direction. I started going south. And I started going to the Chateau Champlain building, which is, uh, we called it the cheese grater. And if you've ever been in Montreal, it's an older building. And it's all these semicircular windows, big hotel. And uh, I knew that building. We called it the cheese grater. And I said, oh, that's the wrong way. So I turned around and I started heading off the other, other direction. And I wouldn't have known it then, but I would have crossed um, St. Catherine Street. And then I would have crossed the Maisonneuve. Didn't recognize the names, of course. And then I finally would have got up and did get up to Sherbrooke Street. Um, and Sherbrooke Street, I recognized. I remember reading it called Sherbrooke. I know Sherbrooke. We live near Sherbrooke Street. And uh, if this aha went, maybe if I follow this, use it as a guardrail of sorts, and maybe I'll find home. Well, we started to walk and walk and walk and um, freezing cold, dart into buildings, warm up, keep going. And uh, several hours later, I remember seeing the familiar sights of a, of a, a hill that we used to toboggan on, Murray Hill. I knew I was going the right way, and I knew my way home at that point. Finally, I stumbled in home hours and hours, well after midnight. Uh, and it was funny because I remember uh, seeing it, my home <laughs> and uh, seeing a police car in front of the house and then thinking to myself, I wonder, why is there a police car in front of my home? Just like having no clue, right? And I, and I really felt like I'd done something bad, like I was at fault here, which of course I wasn't. But I got home to a very relieved mom, dad, and police officers. And there was this weird emotion as this young little guy who took it on himself to do something and really overcame all these obstacles I didn't think I could do and did do. And everyone was so proud of me. And um, it wasn't long after that I had this dream of, uh, of skiing to the South Pole, interestingly, or North Pole. I had this Arctic expedition in mind. It's kind of crazy because I was an inner city kid with no idea. So I always attributed to that, interesting, as a nine-year-old, uh, was my first taste of an Arctic expedition. So that's my first Arctic expedition. That's very, <laughs> very interesting. But it, it, it kind of guides your whole life, right? And, yeah. And, and what you're doing now, so like for this expedition coming up, because, um, you know, with the, with the broadcasting live into the, the schools, 25,000 schools, which is amazing. So you're yeah. going to be teaching about geography. You're going to be teaching about the land. You're also inspiring about. Uh, indigenous culture yep. and Inuit culture out there. So you're getting to, and also how you're actually doing it, you know, the, yep. you know, the, the physical expedition of yep. doing that. So you're sharing that experience with, with all these kids and, and all the film production that's going to 
come afterwards. So when you're going through your preparation moments now and you're in your training and you're skiing up Seymour on your on, on the roller mm. uh, skis, which is incredible. Like do you do you sort of envision yourself as that nine year old kid again, like kind of charting new new territory? Like nobody else is doing what you guys are about to do. It's 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 very impressive. But it's 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 it doesn't sound like it's it's scary or challenging, but it sounds like this is what is possible. Do you feel like you're showing yourself what is possible and what you're gonna show all these other kids what is well, possible? Yeah, you hope, right? You never know for sure. And um I always try to drill down to people is uh like, why do you do what you do? And, you know, it's very easy to say that flippantly. And very few people know their purpose. Like, truly, why do you do what you do? And it should be, it's like, oh, no, I, I like to make money. Well, probably not really a purpose. I mean, it's important to, you know, to survive. But your true purpose um, is something that took me a lot of years to really kind of come to clue, uh, a sense of. And um, uh, interestingly, it was really out in the Northwest Passage that it, it came to me and it was because beforehand i had uh decided i was going to uh leave a message to my daughters uh up there and if they ever want to see it because i have two young daughters well now are older daughters um and if they ever want to see what i had to say to them was um uh they'd have to go up there and get it and i remember thinking fairly lightheartedly about it but then wrote these notes to them uh and when I started doing it, it only dawned on me when I was writing the notes that if they ever do read them, they may, it may not be in my lifetime. You know, I might be not here anymore. So I'm speaking to my da daughters in the future. That changes things a lot. And uh, your sense of why you do what you do comes to the fore and writing that all out. And I remember writing those notes and we're of Irish descent and I bought these clada rings, these... Uh, wedding rings like uh, the, the Irish wedding ring and I bought one for each one and then slipped the note into each one and put it in this ABS super seal container brought it up north and I remember I laid it out and it's up there still and but it got me certainly when I was putting it down and really uh thinking about why I do what I do because I was we were sticking our necks out on that northwest passage journey big time and it was a number and it was right after a big incident where we nearly got pulled under this huge ice flow very sketchy and um so really, it was like, wow, that was close. And then you have this thought, why am I doing this? You know, and it was then it really, it, it finally kind of gelled together in a simple way is, you know, uh, like I'm inspiring others through my actions to be the best that they can be. That's my purpose, to inspire others, so to be the best that they can be through my actions. And it kind of connects to everything I do. Uh, if I think about it, if I'm writing a book, if I'm creating art, if I'm doing whatever it is, it's uh, there's that inspiration. I'm taking a huge amount of inspiration from it, but also uh, you hope there's more to it than that. It's not all m you. And in the beginning with expeditions, um, I realized I was drawn to something that was bringing awareness to something more so than just a physical effort. Uh, and the ones I really enjoyed were ones that, that was like the, you had mentioned in the opening, the Sendakan Death March retracing uh, a death march that uh, had never been retraced and it was the first time and we retraced it and chronicled that and uh, 2750 soldiers had died on that journey or well, pardon me six had survived of 2750 that were marched across this awful thing and bringing awareness to that was like that was a real power in that to me i really found that uh an important journey so it was using these abilities i guess you gain as an as, as an adventurer and your ability to deal with adversity and challenge and fitness and all the things that go with that. But there's something more to it than just saying, Hey, I was just really fast or I was, did, you know, I did this. That is great. And the South Pole was kind of that, I suppose, but I'm less inspired by that. And it's like, yeah, whatever. Yeah. So yeah, we did good. Big deal. I'm way more interested in the ones where we went to Northwest Passage to bring awareness to the changes up there. And we didn't succeed, actually. Ended up getting blasted by storms and couldn't finish the darn thing. But um, there was more important in my mind. There was more of a message there. And I wrote a book about that. And I just found, for me, that's where adventure lies. There has to be more to it than just simple self gratification, which is important to a degree. But um, it has to be more. Uh, I'm too old, frankly. Amazing. Yeah. So it's an inspiration of, of the doing with the meaning and purpose behind it. Yeah. I mean, I'm sort of the same way. Like I'm going to 
can do a book, can do a talk, can do a show, can do future performances in front of people. Yep. Anything's possible, right? And, yep. and, and time is tight here. Yeah. And so if tight. we we can continue to do things that surprise ourselves and are challenging for ourselves and fun for ourselves, and yep. we get to behave like children and, and have fun doing it because we want to, because it feels good, and that can inspire others to to you know do the same for whatever that means for for their lives. Yeah, a hundred percent. And and you mentioned being a child. I mean, isn't that what we all want? Like, remember that was feelings as a kid when you just like yeah, just you're just loving that moment of doing what you're doing. And I guess I aspire to that in everything I do. I want to, I don't enjoy it. Like I'm really not getting an enjoyment out of it. I quit. I, I've, <laughs> I've done that my whole life. If I don't like it, I move on. That's not working for me. And uh, there has to be that moment, that flow state, whatever you want to call it, they call it these days, where you just get into it and you get wrapped in it and you really, it's special. It doesn't mean it's easy. It doesn't mean, uh, mean there's not hard times in it. But there has to be more. There has to be that something. And I think with all the things, I think that's why I do a lot of different things is that I just don't obsess on one thing. There's too many things. Life's too short. Let's try to try it all, right? Yes. And uh, the things that don't work out, move on. And the things that do, embrace it and try it, you know? And it's great fun. So, um, yeah. The work that you do with the AIP group, the leadership, leadership work with the facilitation yep. and, and corporations around north america yeah. around the world and and you do this with with other extreme folks like yeah. yourself big wave surfers yes. ultra marathon runners yeah. and you tie the adversity of these expeditions that you do with leadership and i was watching one uh, clip of yours and, and you mentioned purpose like you can't you know it's hard for for folks in the corporate world in our in our jobs to to show up continually every day for however many years yep. without some sort of underlying meaning and purpose to it so if someone's listening and you know maybe they have a couple passions and then they have a job but they're looking for that something else that that purpose in their work or in their lives and their family whatever it may be how so how do you help the groups that you facilitate and work with um get clarity on that find meaning and purpose yeah well uh like the, we i try to encourage people to come up with a purpose statement and uh and it takes time it's not something like you just go in the room and come up with it like you really have to reflect and muse on it and uh it's you know one is is finding kind of a spark like something that draws you it has to draw you uh, in some way um and then it's slowly building meaning into that spark. Like there has to be more to it. Like obviously if you enjoy running, great. Uh, but well, maybe there's more to it. Maybe can you use running towards something? And then purpose has to be involved with that as well. And and finally is that, how is it creating legacy for you? Because in, a, in many ways, uh, or how is it giving back? That's really important because the real purpose uh, should stand where like whatever you're doing is not for you, it's for someone else or for everyone else. And that's a really important piece of it uh, is that uh, if we rarely have a, or we don't have a purpose, if it's purely like, well, I just want to get as much money as I can. Maybe if you're Donald Trump, I suppose, I don't know. But uh, is that, but generally that's not it. You know, there has to be more to it. And uh, it's not an easy mechanism, but we go through a series of having people addressing and having them fill this out and finally coming up with an idea to work on based on a framework and then moving forward with it. Um, too long to get into here, of course, but it's uh, it gets people thinking about it. And I think that's critical, but critical elements are like a spark and legacy and meaning uh, and thinking that, but there has to be that. You have to want to do it, obviously, because. Uh, you won't find purpose in something you hate doing. Uh, there has to be something. And the kids want to do that. They will. Like it's going back to that play point is very important, I think. Um, you never want to lose that. We never want to lose our desire to just play. Do you do you ever lose yours? Do you ever do you ever do you ever get discouraged or or, oh, or distracted? Like Always. or do you have expedition you have the 2025 expedition planned no, already? No, no, I, I, I focus on one thing at a time. Mm -hmm. uh, but you never know, right? Things come up. Right? 2023, we, uh, part of, what year are we now? 2023, so 2021. Um, we uh, we attempted it, failed, and uh, paused. So, okay, next year we're going to do this. And uh, this time uh, last year, Ray was, uh, my teammate was diagnosed with cancer. 
and um, uh, lymphoma. So we're like, okay, what does that even mean for his life, right? And uh, Bing Ray, the most like amazing character, he just says, well, I'm going to get through this. It's going to take six months, and we're going to do this next year. Well, we are. And amazingly, he's got through this. And uh, between chemo treatments, we went up north last year and did this mini expedition, which is madness in many ways, but incredibly inspiring. It's like, you know, we're here for a short time. Like you can, and it's interesting because I don't know if I would have reacted that way. I think I may have just spiraled into some very unhappy place. And this guy didn't. And I was, I took a great amount of motivation from that, inspiration from that is that we don't know what we got. We don't know what cards we've been given. We really, we never know. So live for now, in this anticipation, I'm going to, well, when I retire, oh, geez, you know, I always said, now I'm at retirement age. But uh, I always said Freedom 35 for me was like I retired a long time ago because I went, I moved away from stuff that I didn't really want to do. And I started to do stuff that I did want to do. And as long as I live, I'm going to keep doing the things I want to do. And hopefully some of it makes money. So be it. But that's where I want to live my life. I'm not going to be uh, just, uh, you know, working, 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 thinking that someday I'll be able to enjoy it. And then realizing when I get to that point, I don't have any other interests and I've left everything behind that I did. And that's not a really good place to be. So not for me. And okay, let's talk about, because a, a part of that, a huge part of that is, and everything you do, because you also do architecture, really, yep. really gorgeous single family home architecture. And you've mentioned design a couple of times and, yep. and creativity a little bit as well. But, you know, the creativity side where, you know, even if we're not creating art or, or something like that, like our, how, how we move through, through each and every day and how we think and, and how we interact with others and what we do, you know, that, that is an element of it expression and creativity yep. just alone like that maybe we're not you know architecturally designing houses or creating paintings or writing songs whatever it may be but you you must dial you must think about creativity a lot especially when you're doing you know these long i imagine there's a lot of long solo training yep um, that you need to do for everything that you do so you're sending spending a lot of time in nature moving through nature uh, thinking about what's coming up and, and what you want to do and create. So how do you, how do you, how do you see creativity? How do you see, see creativity, whether with your, the design that you do and do in architecture or how you design this expedition that is coming up? Like how, how important is creativity and, and design um, to you? And how do you, how do you sort of bring the best out of that and, and get excitement from that? Well, it's personal expression, right? Uh, whatever it happens to be, be it painting, music, architecture, or an expedition is the creativity part is like coming up with the idea and you come up with a like this kind of thought and it's the same thing. Like I'll compare it to a, a house I've been designing, uh, which is over here um, uh, on the West side. And uh, you know, it like, no, I, you have this kind of crazy idea. And uh, for me, it was a, a deconstructed cube. And the reason being because the house it sits adjacent to is the cube house. It's called uh, just over here near Jericho. And um, it's known infamously or famously as a cube house. Some people love it. I think it's amazing. Other people don't like it at all. But it's a cube. And, uh, and I thought, well, maybe point counterpoint. So I thought it'd be kind of fun. Uh, it naturally starts to become a deconstructed cube of sorts with views to the north and, and so forth. And it was really, uh, it, was, it, it sounds so uh, esoteric like it's but that's the nature of art and that's where you start in architecture as much as you would saying wouldn't it be cool if i could wouldn't it could or do this or like some idea for an adventure it's very much an expression of yourself of what inspires you and then you have to drill down on it and make it a reality and as much in architecture is that you have to take these whimsical drawings you do and ideas and that you sell to a client then you have to have it to a point in terms of a technical package that you can submit it to the city of Vancouver and go through that process and then ultimately have a, and meeting all the zoning and all the building code issues, and then ultimately have this set of drawings given to a group of, of uh, craftsmen and builders who can put it together exactly the way you envisioned it. And so you really have to get down to the details. Uh, so it's an interesting process. And I find it very similar to the adventure world where you have this idea do something cool and wouldn't that be amazing if and and all the, the that associated with it which is the creative side and then it has to drill down to saying i have budgets for this i gotta pay for this <laughs> gotta do that what piece of gear do i need and making it all work together but i tell you when you come out the other end seeing a finished product um or finishing a really difficult challenging expedition and doing it successfully 
Uh, it's a similar gratification of feeling like you've done something. And it's also an inspiration. Like it's, it's showing others through your actions, what you're doing. Like, it's like, wow, this actually can be done. Maybe I can do that too. And uh, I find them very similar. And the, the act of doing it, whatever it happens to be. But you must love the, at least on the architecture side and even the expedition side, you must love the creativity and, and the process enough to go through those challenging times where you have to make the drawings and you have to submit to the city yep. or you have to get funding or you have to make a hundred phone calls to get, get one back and get some sponsorship. You must, you must love the drive of the creation and, and, and the, and the overall larger mission to go through those challenging uh, mundane tasks. Yeah. And it's all part of it, right? Like you don't get one without the other in a sense. So you want to understand that and you try to find something good in it and something interesting in it. Uh, yes. There's times with architectural drives where like, I'm really done with this. This is so tedious. Um, but you know that it needs to be done it for later on to make sure that it's done right. Because if it's not, then they're going to make mistakes. And that comes with experience. Over the years, I've learned that the hard way is that it has to be fully articulated for someone to get it. No mistakes made. And same in many ways in, you know, uh, in adventure, right? Uh, I mean, Roald Amundsen had the famous saying, adventure is just, and the concept of adventure is just poor planning. And his, which I don't necessarily agree with, but, uh, but his idea was, and, you know, in his uh, very Scandinavian mentality was that you can prepare everything and there should be no adventure. It should be prepared and done. And I like that approach, of course, but invariably something's going to go wrong when you're trying something that <laughs> no one's tried before. Um, and you have to be able to adjust and pivot and do whatever you have to do to deal with that. But do be, you want to be well prepared. You don't want to go into it unprepared. And same with architecture. Uh, you do it as best you can. And invariably, when they're building, something's going to come up. They're going to build it wrong. It's going to be off by three inches. Now what? Okay, well, let's figure this out. Uh, you have to work with it. But uh, try to get it as close as possible and then just let it do its thing. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the success of the product or whatever it may be, the expedition is whatever percentage going to be based on the preparation that has been done ahead yeah. of time. I think that speaks to anything and everything we do. But it's, 100%. at least for for everything I do, I have to also be not attached to it going a very specific way it's like you know you know you said you said um you know in the preparation for this expedition there, there there's obviously so much that happens ahead of time but you get not i get i get this even when i go on vacation and stuff there's so much to 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 prepare ahead of time pack and think and plan and book things but as soon as you get on that airplane or across the border or get in the car you're like you made it Right? Yep. And you have to kind of surrender to yep. what's going to happen because not everything's going to go the way that you plan. Yeah, totally. And I mean, the most poignant moment for that for me was on the Rowan Ice Shelf uh, in Antarctica when we got flown down by this tiny little plane, landed on the sea ice, not kicked out the doors with our sleds. And the next stop was South Pole, which was 1,134 kilometers away across the Antarctic continent. And the plane just took off. And you're like, we are committed with what we brought here. If we've got a day's food, we're going without food. If we got our got our booties, you know, you got to deal with it from this point forward. So it, it's, it really frees you up in many ways. And uh, we were confident, but still you realize, wow, pretty committed here, man. <laughs> <laughs> Good stories to have. Well, no, this has been incredible. So how can, how can people keep track of... Or you know, get get more information from you and what you're doing, whether in the speaking and training, or the the architecture, or this up, upcoming expedition. Yeah, I mean, it's just me, my name. If you just type in my name on, and we'll, um, yeah, we'll put yeah. it in the show notes and links and all that uh, as well. Certainly, websites. I have a I, uh, two websites, but if you put in my name, you'll see both. I have a uh, adventure website and I have a architecture website, both different. Um, and you can get a sense of what I do in the architectural world. It's all laid out there, and uh, on my professional site uh pardon me on my professional site and on my adventure site you can just see all the stuff i do as well in terms of uh speaking and uh leadership training and my expeditions yeah so there's and there's a link there to the expedition that's coming up is there a way for us to for also to follow along in february march oh there will be and we, when everything goes live and it really will i mean there's a very it's a small site up there now um but uh and you can get that through my website but it's going to be a very robust site that you'll be able to follow daily. We'll be tracking daily. We're going to be uh, sharing all sorts of, as much as we can through satellite images, video and everything. Right there. It should be great. 
Well, you inspired me already today because I was reading through a lot of your material last night and watching some videos and I'm like, man, I don't want to, but I'm going to get up and go for a run tomorrow morning. Yeah. <laughs> I at least need to get my body moving <laughs> yes, and and feel good. So I, I appreciate that. But no, thanks. Thanks for this. And right. yeah, we're, we're, we're rooting for you. <laughs> yeah, it should be great. But it's going to be so cool to get to experience that without actually having to do it for the rest of us. Exactly. It's very hard to experience until you're really in it, but you'll get a sense of it for sure. Beautiful. All right. Thank All you. Right, thank you. Yeah.